Welcome. I am Dr. Zena Crenshaw Logal, and we're here today for a special Global Week to Act for SDGs, Turning Point Deep Dive Discussion, an edition of the Turning Point Dialogue Series and People Assembly. We are turning it around for targets of organized U.S. legal system abuse. I am a co-founder an executive committee member and executive director of your host, National Judicial Conduct and Disability Law Project, Inc. Joining me here today for our deep dive roundtable discussion is an impressive panel of U.S. legal system reform advocates. We've agreed for each to introduce themselves and speak for a few minutes in the alphabetical order of their surname. Our topic is the path to individual, collective, and government healings. Subtopic, America's International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Again, I'll introduce, they're going to introduce themselves, but our panelists are, in alphabetical order, Dr. Linda Cheek, medical doctor, Retta M. Daniel, doctor of jurisprudence, Mr. Robert Hathaway, Jay Joshi, medical doctor, Claudia Morandi, Belinda Parker Brown, Marianne Petrie, and Stacy Penn, registered and certified physician assistant. Hopefully, I didn't mess up anyone's name, and but you know, correct us when you have your when you have your opportunity to speak. Each of you will speak four minutes. And then you have two minutes of closing remarks after we've all spoken. Now, for our audience, after our panelists have shared their knowledge, vision, calls to action, and inspiration with us, we'll open up our conference for Q&A and we'll be able to to, to, uh, reflect on their input and everything that you've heard during our half-day conference. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and for interacting. First up, we have medical doctor Linda Cheek. Go ahead, um, Dr. Cheek. If every all the other panelists can mute themselves, and when I call your name, unmute. Um, and and if you just start speaking, Dr. Cheek, we'll have you on the screen. Go ahead. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be the voice of innocent doctors attacked by our rogue Justice Department. My name is Linda Cheek, MD, and I am the founder of Doctors of Courage. The first attack on me was claimed as a Medicare Medicaid fraud case, but the records that the, that the government took were those of uninsured pain patients in order to create a case. After that, my attack number two, I had a doctor that was taking care of pain patients in my office. And the, until the government forced her to relinquish her DEA certificate under threat of incarceration. Dr. Schultz also testified for me on my behalf to get my license reinstated at the Board of Medicine hearing, but she was then shut down by a wor- letter warning her of charges if she continued to speak out in order to shut her up. So at my trial, the DOJ also made her commit perjury. And in every case I've seen, the DOJ threatens of charges or of incarceration or uh, to force perjury from their witnesses. My nurse was interrogated for six hours by agents giving the same threats. Dr. Ganesh, a California family practice doctor, was threatened for hours with prolonged jail time repeatedly if she did not give a false confession statement. A threat commonly used against women in these cases is, you will never be allowed to see your children or family. This threat was also one used against Lynn Kahn, who then testified against her husband. Another abuse of the Justice Department is the collusion between judges and prosecutors. The DEA administrative judge literally told the prosecutor what he should ask at my hearing. And at my trial, after my trial, I visited the, my, the, the physician that was working in my office and asked her, to give to give her to to ask her to give me a character witness at my sentencing, and when I was visiting with her, I asked her, "Why did you lie? You know, you put me in prison." And her reply was, "You're not going to prison. They're just going to slap your hand." 
they visited me so many times that I just didn't know what, remember what the truth was. So their tactic of preparing their witnesses is to basically tell them what testimony they need to get to give. Also, government violation of privacy in my emails was also exposed because a week after visiting with her, I emailed her and two hours later, I was charged with obstruction uh, for visiting her. But they made the mistake of claiming I was visiting, visiting her that day and I had an ironclad alibi. But that did not matter to the judge. He charged me with obstruction and added six months to my sentence. Collusion with judges and prosecution goes right up the ladder. In spite of the exposure of prosecutorial misconduct, circuit courts up uphold the district court decisions, and the Supreme Court won't even hear our cases. Lawbreaking includes government agents going to a doctor with a complaint of pain and then testifying in court they really didn't have pain, and the doctor is charged with distribution. The agent committed the crime, not the doctor. They failed to get me to prescribe to one of their plants, so they actually called the script in themselves, in my name, for the patient. This law breaking was exposed in all of my appeals to no avail. The government violates our human rights by fabricating evidence, not providing exculpatory evidence, or modifying patient records to create a crime that was never committed. With Dr. Ganesh, 40,000 records with names redacted that were not her patients were presented as a crime. This should have been automatically reversed, but circuit court, again in collusion, upheld the conviction. What we have in America is a rogue government creating crime simply because they can. Two categories of doctors are primary targets, and this is also a violation of human rights, minorities and elderly doctors. The training in the DOJ is to go where the money is and the guns aren't. By using the laws in ways they were never intended, the government confiscates everything a doctor owns, leaving them penniless. The effects of this violation of our human rights is destruction of life, livelihood, and family. Most of us end up destitute. Some commit suicide. My children estranged themselves from me for five years. Many doctors end up losing their spouse. Our constitutional rights are violated. Our human rights are violated. Please end this mis misconduct. Thank you very much for having me on the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheeks. And now we're going to hear from Retta M. Daniel Alcaraz, Jewish Doctorate. If you can unmute yourself, Dr. Daniel Alcaraz, and proceed. Uh, listening to Dr. Cheek um, brings up all kinds of emotions. Um, tears right here in my throat because it happens over and over and over again to professionals. I had been practicing law for 41 years, no client complaints ever, not one. I had prosecuted for the state bar for eight years. I testified as an expert witness and defended lawyers for 28 years. And suddenly, I get an envelope from the state bar thinking it's for one of my clients that I'm defending before the state bar. I open it up and it's a petition for disability inquiry for me. And I'm looking at it at first and I think, you know, why are they doing this? The prosecutors, they own the other side of the disciplinary case, a couple of them that I was defending. So, of course, those two prosecutors knew I was doing a good job and those defense cases like I'd done for 28 years after I left the state bar. And then it hit me. It's the only confidential proceeding that the Virginia State Bar has. So I waived my confidentiality. It is also the only proceeding in which they could appoint a guardian ad litem for you if you don't get a lawyer. So I got a good friend to step in to say he was my lawyer to prevent a guardian being appointed. Because, of course, the guardian would have been a state bar um, participant, if you will. And uh, so I, okay, I know what to do. I prosecuted these cases. I'll send them doctor's reports saying I'm perfectly sane. I'm competent to practice law. I know what I'm doing. I'm, def you know, I'm defending in, in, pro in the 
proceedings. I'm also representing people as the plaintiff's attorney and medical malpractice and all kinds of different cases like that. And then I'm an expert witness in ethics for the state of Virginia. And I go all over the state and testify. And in fact, I did out of state cases too. So I thought, okay, I know what they're doing. They, they want to take me out because I'm exposing their corruption. And the only way they can do it secretly is with a, the only confidential thing they have, which is an impairment inquiry. Oh, I knew I was not going to let them get my medical records, which I knew would be the next step. So I, I get counsel. He falls right in step with the state bar prosecutors, tells me they're going to revoke my license if I don't cooperate. And I said, well, I'm not cooperating. I want you to challenge this on a constitutional level because they have no evidence I'm impaired. I'm not impaired. He refused to do that in state or federal court went to the hearing and they ordered me at the end of the hearing to produce five years of medical records from all my medical providers, everybody. And I said, no. And so they said, okay, if you don't produce these in 15 days, we're going to suspend your license. I said, fine. So I didn't. And they secretly conspiring with some defense attorneys set up a, a, a case in circuit court where I needed to appear on behalf of a client. I didn't know about it. She didn't know about it. Two days before that hearing, she gets a letter in the mail. I hadn't gotten anything saying we had to be in court for this hearing. No notice of hearing or anything. It was civil. I told her, I said, I can't take the chance because that's the day they can suspend my license, the 24th. You're going to have to go by yourself and take a, she's a daughter of a judge and take a letter with you saying that, you know, you fired me and you want another attorney. I was representing her for free. So she did that. So the judge issued a capius for my arrest because he said he didn't believe, and it's in the transcript that I didn't know about the hearing, but we, even if I had known two days ahead, it was no way to get prepared for it because he was going to dismiss everything for her. 30 seconds, Dr. Daniel. Adams. Okay. So the second year after that, I, I got suspended. You can't appeal a suspension in a disability case in Virginia as a lawyer. So I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not practicing. I'll just go about my way. I'll continue to expose them. The next year they brought misconduct charges against me for the same facts, and they disbarred me, which meant I can't practice law because now I'm disbarred. I still have my license. They have no right to take the license in Virginia, but they don't recognize that. They have no statutory right to do so. Plus, the last thing I'm going to say is that this disciplinary board and the district committees for the State Bar of Virginia are appointed by the Supreme Court. They're not appointed by the legislature. Consequently, you can't take those hearing officers who act as judges to the Judicial Inquiry and Review Commission when they act and commit misconduct as judicial officers because they're not judges. So if you go to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court says go to the Judicial Inquiry and Review Commission. You go to the Judicial Inquiry and Review Commission, they say go to the state bar, but the state bar appointed all those people through the Supreme Court. So it's a complete circle, like Zena was talking about earlier. You, you, it's, a, it's a hamster wheel that you're on. There's no redress. Mm -hmm. Although now we figured out a way to seek redress in Virginia, but it Thank won't you. last but a few months. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Daniel Acarez. And um, I don't see uh, Mr. Robert Hathaway on our screen. So what we'll do is we'll move to a uh, presentation, if we can, from Dr. Medical Dr. J. Joshi. Joshi. And thank you, Dr. Local, and thank you for facilitating this. And thank you for everybody for attending this forum. It is of the utmost importance. Before I begin, I would like to discuss four points in theory and then discuss my own case. The first is the concept of this covenant. The second one is its application in healthcare. The third, its application with the opiate epidemic. And then fourth, how you are able to then 
demonstrate theory into application with virtuating healthcare outcomes due to legal and judicial misconduct. The purpose of this covenant is to give individuals an additional right to ensure due process. The court systems in the United States are predicated on a system of checks and balances, yet we see an overwhelming number of criminal cases and in plea bargains. This is because part of the individual right to defend himself or herself is taken away. So anytime there becomes an opportunity for a direct or collateral attack on a conviction, we as individuals must mandate that those be recognized. Unfortunately, as we discussed before, these are not being recognized. And in healthcare, this poses an especially significant problem because many of the laws in healthcare attempt to simplify complex healthcare behavior into a simplified rubric of law. What that does is impose undue burdens upon select individuals. These would include patients with chronic pain, patients with substance use dependency, which has now come to the forefront of American ethos with the opiate epidemic. With opiate epidemic, you're starting to see select physicians, as Dr. Cheek had mentioned, disproportionately targeted in a discriminatory manner, and certain patients also be targeted in a discriminatory manner. The way the courts are able to pursue this systematically is through a discernible pattern of prosecutorial misconduct and judicial misconduct. And as a result of that, you are starting to see worse patient outcomes. The prosecutorial misconduct and judicial misconduct, I repeat, has created a pattern of worse patient outcomes adversely affecting the healthcare system as a whole. In terms of my individual example, I had an employee who was systematically forging scripts under my name. When I reported her to the police, what had happened, the police sensing an opportunity to indict a physician took perjured testimony from this employee and used to secure a grand jury indictment against me. I was not able to find any lawyers in my area who were to defend me. And after speaking with two defense attorneys, I felt that the only logical course was for me to plead guilty. As many people in this situation will find, there was no individual redress available for an obvious prosecutorial misconduct. In the end, I was able to regain my license. But what this really demonstrates is that when we take a law and the misconduct of law and apply it to inappropriate jurisprudence, we fail to understand appropriate constitutionally sound manners of investigating and adjudicating healthcare laws. This has now led to a direct impact in patient care. And for all of us who are attending this forum, we should be very mindful that the way we can demonstrate effective redress, gross violations of rights, objective discern of patterns of misconduct is through the patient outcomes. If we can demonstrate that these legal misconducts at the prosecutorial and judicial levels are adversely affecting patient care, we have the data to demonstrate the impact of the misconduct. And so I would encourage everybody to work together, to collaborate. We all have our own unique perspectives. We all have our own respective strengths. Together, we can create the models as Dr. Daniel Alcatraz was referring to, that would help us understand what are the specific actions at the prosecutorial and judicial level that are leading to objective, discernible patterns of patient outcomes that are worsening. So I'd encourage all of us to work together and determine ways we could help each other to pursue that. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much for a great presentation. And now we're gonna hear from medical doctor uh, Richard Call. Dr. Call, unmute yourself and go ahead. Oh, thank, thank you, Zina. Yeah, I apologize for the, um, the, uh, the techno presentation here on the screen. But uh, anyway, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you, Zina, uh, for this very important uh, panel and discussion. Uh, my name is Dr. Richard Call, uh, and I'm speaking here today in support of the opt-in movement and its mission to have enforced America's international covenant on civil and political rights. For the last 10 years, my fundamental human rights to life, liberty and property have been egregiously violated in the United States by state actors, agencies, and the American judicial system. 
in a scheme that I would never have believed had it not happened to me. Pulling the strings of this scheme were and are publicly traded for-profit American corporations. But before I talk any further about my experience of judicial corruption in American courts, I would like to say a few words as to how my life's journey brought me to this point and to this panel. I'm 56 years old, a citizen of India, the country in which I was born. I grew up in England, where I graduated from medical school in 1988 and became a physician. From 1989 to 1995, I underwent postgraduate training in New York, where I undertook training in surgery and anesthesiology. In 1995, I returned to the United Kingdom, where I undertook further training in the field of interventional pain. And in 2001, I returned to the United States. In 2002 to 2012, I built one of the most successful, minimally invasive spine surgery practices in the United States. And in 2005, I invented a procedure that revolutionized the field of spine. Because of my success, and partly because I was an Indian immigrant, I came under constant legal attacks to my practice and reputation. From 2005 to 2012, the viciousness of these attacks escalated. And in 2012, the New Jersey State Medical Board suspended my license. In 2014, after intense legal proceedings in a corrupt New Jersey administrative law court, my license was illegally revoked. The revocation caused me to lose everything. I was 47 in 2012. And by 2014, my entire medical career had been stolen from me. I began medical school at the age of 18. And so 29 years of working 70 hours a week were illegally taken from me because of my success. By 2014, I was homeless and had fallen into a state of poverty. The revocation had a massive impact on my children. They were evicted from their childhood home by corrupt New Jersey state court judges who followed orders from an equally corrupt state governor who himself took orders from insurance companies that owed me and my medical practice money. The money they owed me was for clinical care I had provided to their injured clients. The insurance companies had my license revoked because they did not want to pay their debt to me. As the less money they paid to me, the more money would go to their executives and to increase in share price. One of the many casualties of this American judicial corruption was the Spine Africa Project, a 501c3 charity that I established in 2008, which up until late 2012 provided free healthcare to people at the Pansy Hospital the Democratic Republic of Congo. The charity also provided free education to doctors in the management of spinal injuries, the result of working in extremely hazardous mines. The judicial corruption in America that aided and abetted the loss of my livelihood prevented me from continuing the work of the charity. In 2015, I started teaching myself the law as I believed 30 that seconds, I, Dr. Call. That I could not find justice in New Jersey administrative courts. It has become obvious to me that the only way I will find justice in America is to look for justice outside of America. And in that regard, I have commenced legal proceedings in India against, amongst others, the state of New Jersey. We live in a global society, and I believe that American citizens should have the same rights as those of a Danish citizen and in fact, most other citizens of the world. And I believe that the enforcement of the ICCPR through public pressure, legislative and legal action will begin the process of, as Zena so eloquently puts it, a healing. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Call. Now we're going to backtrack and hear from our panelist, Mr. Robert Hathaway. So, Mr. Hathaway, if you can unmute your microphone and go ahead with your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Zena. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm the chairman and CEO of the Foundation for the Protection of Constitutional Rights. I'm also a technologist, a researcher, and a software architect for over 30 years. I'll discuss the need today to action, implement, and enforce the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights to stop a pattern of severe and egregious violations and deprivations of constitutional, civil, and human rights in the United States. We've been fighting this for a number of years now. Uh, today, there are no effective redress of grievances or relief offered from the judiciary. Virtually every attempt by attorneys, and we're working with many of them, stop deprivations of rights under color of law have failed with no redress or relief provided those most in need. Our attorneys have filed dozens of federal lawsuits. Uh, they've met stiff resistance. I work with and collaborate with dozens of state and federal fighter attorneys, as I call them, across the United States. Uh, just since this past Wednesday, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act was pronounced a failure, completely dead, by President Joe Biden. Uh, we had advocated the components of this since 2018 to Senate, New Jersey Senator Booker as a start to bringing awareness and to stop the qualified immunity the United States Judiciary and Enforcement had used for decades to violate and deprive constitutional rights in the United States. I'll be discussing more about the need to end qualified immunity and to force deprivations of rights under color of law by U.S. Civil Rights Statutes Code, Title 18, Section 242, which is the law to implement the United States Constitution and constitutional rights and civil law, which perpetuates a, a pattern of violation and deprivation of rights, which continues to this day. We need to action the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The most important efforts to improve constitutional, civil, and human rights in the United States are well known to the people and attorneys fighting for these rights every day against a system that openly and egregiously violates and deprives and deprives the rights of people, including families, parents, and children. As one example among many, I will discuss a legal battle against such egregious violation of rights, which went on with great uh, and severe suffering for four years. I've heard from and helped thousands of people asking for help from a pool of millions of people, up to 21 million, suffering from state actions, similar actions against families. We have created a new 501c3 public charity to help the Foundation for the Protection of Constitutional Rights. We have a petition with almost 5,000 signatures presented to the White House from those desperately seeking help from clear cut and egregious violations of the rights and liberties, including egregious, grievous harm to their children, to our children. We are collaborating with over a dozen attorneys fighting for families with state, federal trials, appeals, uh, federal lawsuits for their address and relief with U.S. civil rights statutes, including U.S. Code Title 42, 1983, deprivation of rights under color of law, and are trying to gain enforcement with Title 18, Section 242. But enforcement is non-existent with officials, including prosecutors, the FBI and DOJ, which we've been in touch with, refusing to take cases against the state and federal 1983 suits for constitutional rights and civil rights acts that have failed in virtually all cases to the extent that attorneys are now fighting with state constitution and civil rights acts in New Jersey. They have no choice. These most important ongoing efforts are stopped to the largest extent by qualified immunity, which in the state of New Jersey explicitly adds absolute, complete, and sovereign immunity. Uh, this unconstitutional immunity has no basis in law or justice, which protects public officials who commit crimes against people come from across all branches of government, including judicial, legislative, and executive. We found the judicial branch at all levels violate and deprive rights more than any other and have dozens of federal lawsuits, both partially and completely denied in New Jersey, including ours, alone showing that the courts of the judicial branch flagrantly denying the rights and stop relief to those suffering deprivation of rights under color of law. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled qualifying immunity, which literally exempts public officials from their sworn duty to protect the unalienable civil rights of Americans. Those rights are violated most severely and egregiously and lead to the decomposition of children and adults, often left suffering PTSD, even more severe than returning combat veterans, which includes the Fourth Amendment violations, include the Fourth Amendment right to be secure in our homes and papers and free from unreasonable search and seizure, and the Fourteenth Amendment right to equal protection under the law, presumption of innocence, and the right to due process. They're openly violated by judges and the right to due process, which are openly violated 
uh, every day. Civil courts, which include the actions of states against individuals, children, and entire families, openly violate the seventh, also violate the Seventh Amendment right to trial by jury. They give no juries, giving judges absolute tyranny over people in their courts. They're just seconds, always go along with uh, absurd and unconstitutional state actions, regardless of the lack of any substantiated evidence and completely ignore exculpatory evidence. When New Jersey judge we were involved in was asked about violating constitutional rights, including the Fifth Amendment, right, when being forced to take fraudulent state paid psychological evaluations, which are genuinely fraudulent, the judge replied, you have no rights. Where are the charges? Uh, these are unalienable rights that should never be taken away. These evaluations paid for by the state are routinely used to disparage and character assassinate dependents, um, defendants regularly proven court falsified and fraudulent. Um, we have hundreds of documents. We have uh, egregious uh, violations of rights, uh, including um, uh, when there was school apartheid. Uh, we have a lot of documents, but we don't really have time to go into. And it started when, when they came by and we, we said we had learned about apartheid and segregation school leading to bullying. They said, oh, well, help. A day later, they attacked the house, uh, attacked the children. It took four years to fight them off. Uh, they lied, committed perjury in court. Um, again, we can go into it much later, but uh, we really need to end qualified immunity. That stops the federal suits and the actions that are really needed to stop these kinds of crimes. And it's a long, big pattern of abuse that we know are going on to, to tens of thousands a year. Jerry Milner of the uh, Children's Bureau also has testified to that. Thank you so much, Mr. Hathaway. Um, now, we, it appears that uh, Ms. Miranda is not on uh, screen, Claudia Miranda, our, our panelist. So we're going to move to Belinda Parker Brown. And Ms. Parker Brown, if you could just unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Zena, so much for having me. Um, my, bl my blood is literally bawling listening to the stories of the victims. You know, I have um, devoted uh, my life to fighting for um, transformation change in the system that is fundamentally unjust. I, um, I'm a civil rights, um, well, civil constitutional human rights activist that, um, focus on the injustice in the criminal justice system. And here in Louisiana, we are ground zero for the legal system just being an abomination. It is a disgrace to the whole United States of America. You know, I wanna talk about, uh, uh, you know, um, when the fix is in. And, and what we call it here is that the fox is guarding the hen house when the fix is in. You got your judge, you got your lawyer, you got the district attorney, you got the police, the sheriff, all of them working in cahoots to get a conviction against you, especially when they are the ones that have it wrong. When they have manufactured a case against you, when they are deliberately violating all of your constitutional rights and looking you in the face and say, what the hell are you gonna do about it? You know, this is the boiling point. When families are being destroyed, you know, we had one case where the young man had a accident. He was hit by a semi truck and his lawyer did not disclose to him that he was working with the same insurance company that this man was supposed to receive a settlement from. So the man goes and say to the lawyer, he said, it appeared to me as though you're on their side. 
you're supposed to be fighting for me. I almost died in this accident. I have had several surgeries. I'm in pain. My family is suffering. We're losing everything we have because I can't work. And this young man committed suicide when he found out after recording his lawyer in a meeting that the lawyer was not working for him. The lawyer was working for the insurance company that the district attorney happened to be in partnership with and receiving campaign donations. I'm talking about the insurance company people that was paying the lawyer to force this man to settle for peanuts versus and what he deserved. So we have so many horror stories of how people have been weaponized and abused by the criminal just by this corrupt legal system here in the state of America. When they would literally take your tragedy because it's to their advantage, to their own selfish gain, that the lawyer can go in the chambers and make a deal with the judge, a backroom deal, that he will kick your case under the bus and they all will get paid. The lawyer get paid, the judge will get paid, the district attorney get paid, and no one, I'm telling you, we have factual information where the judge would literally take a bribe in my own personal case, took a bribe to sabotage and keep the truth from coming out when people are literally innocent and they would rather give them life in prison before they have the opportunity to have a fair trial. So seconds. no legal redress here in the state of, of America when it comes to when the fix is in and your judge is sleeping with your lawyer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Linda Parker Brown. And now we're going to hear from Marianne Petrie. Um, so, Ms. Petrie, if you just would unmute your microphone and you can go ahead. Hello, my name is Marianne Petrie. I'm a pro se litigant. I'm a whistleblower for family court corruption. I had been a nurse for 23 years. However, false allegations led to indications via CPS. That also pulled me into family court where the judge and the opposing attorney were in collusion. They had a working relationship for years. And I tried to recuse the judge and he refused to do so. He then took the kids away from me and gave them to the ex. And, and then the ex immediately filed for child support. This led to arrears. And what happened was that had built up and the judge put me in prison she wanted me to spend two months in there. I only lasted five days. However, five months after coming out of prison, I did suffer a heart attack with three stents to the LED. In the meantime, I had one, uh, two cases in Superior Court with barely a remedy. The ex has turned the kids against me with using uh, brainwashing and parental alienation. I had written the book, Dismantling Family Court Corruption, Why Taking the Kids Was Not Enough, and Cry Out for Justice, Poems of Truth. I then started the podcast, Slam the Gavel. And if this doesn't shock the conscience, I don't know what does. I've also taken the case of these people that have um, filed false allegations and indications. I've taken it to federal court. 
where I've filed exhibits A through W. That judge in the federal court refused to look at the exhibits and ruled the case and ruled the exhibits irrelevant. Then he wanted to close the case. So I then appealed it to the appellate court. And now that's where it sits. And I don't know if there will be any remedy at law because I've really literally lost everything. I've lost my nursing career and I've lost my children all due to lies and false accusations. And CPS is out of control. They also need to be abolished along with family court. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Petrie. Apologize for putting the wrong emphasis there. So our last but not least is Stacy Penn, who is a registered certified physician assistant. So we're gonna to go to speaker view and Ms. Penn, just unmute your microphone and you can begin. Thank you, Dr. Zena and to our concerned listeners for the honor of being chosen as a parent representative of those who are experiencing legal system abuse in the custody courts and family courts. Most important, I'm honored to be a parent as a voice to children and minors in their right to live free from harm. These are some of the most fundamental aspects of our constitution and inalienable rights that are routinely being ignored by our court system and in fact, to a level of deadly abuses against children via persecution and misuse of our country's legal system. One of the things that's happened most recently in our legal system is I'm a New York state resident and the governor has appointed a blue ribbon commission to assess the role of court forensics. And as previously mentioned by one of our panelists, court forensics are often relied upon uh, very intimately by the judge in to determine custody. Often these court forensics reports are flawed and even fraudulent. And in New York State, they have been identified as a cause in the system that results in taking children from a safe parent and sending them to the abuser, oftentimes the sexual abusive parent. <clears throat> This has resulted in child deaths that are untimely and preventable. And this isn't a case of just one person. This is endemic in our nation. <clears throat> Nothing to date has been done to stop these dangerous reports from being relied upon in our courts. It's only been discussed at this point. Re <clears throat> Regardless, uh, I do agree that our problem results from unchecked immunity, judicial misconduct, and even these court forensics, our Office of Professional Discipline is unable to investigate the conduct of court forensics because their reports are sealed. These are due process violations. And in fact, oftentimes a parent isn't even given access to the custodial report to be able to defend him or herself. Children are dying and judges and court forensics and attorneys for children who participated in the process go unharmed and continue to practice despite causing child deaths and making children live in an unsafe environment. It's not the parent's fault Many parents are fighting and fighting and cannot achieve redress. In my own case, a judge called my children's counselors and told them to ignore any medical evidence of child abuse, child sexual abuse. And the court friends had called the police and CPS and told them not to proceed with their lawful investigation to investigate their disclosures of severe abuse. The father even admitted to using restraint on the children and the children were running away multiple times with police reports and my daughter was endorsing that she was being choked by her father. This is deadly, this is what's killing children. And it's interesting also that our physician panelists are discussing the opioid epidemic when in fact child abuse is directly related 
to an increased risk of opiate and other substance abuse addictions. Instead, the government chooses to look into the deep pockets of pharma who indeed were opportunists, but the government should be looking at itself for these failures when, pe when safe parents try to protect their children and the government sends them to the abuser. This needs to stop. And I couldn't agree more with Optin's position on unchecked judicial misconduct and violations in the court process that are meant to protect families, but inadvertently are being abused and leaving us at risk. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, so, uh, I, I tell you, it just leaves us speechless to hear these stories. And what we're going to do is backtrack through our panel and you have two to three minutes to, to give your closing remarks, whatever remarks you want. But I hope that you all will share with us uh, um, what your inspiration is for continuing to fight your fights for justice, both for yourself and on behalf of similarly situated people. So we're going to start that conversation off again with medical doctor Linda Cheek. So. Dr. Cheek, go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your closing remarks and tell us about what, what inspires you to keep going. Yes, thank you. Um, to respond to some of the comments we made, especially this last one about ACEs being a cause of addiction. Um, in the, um, the, the main problem with attacking doctors is that um, they use the, these steps that the DOJ has actually created that opioids cause addiction, number one. So therefore, all, op people, all people are on an opioid are addicts. Since doctors are giving opioids to patients, they are therefore giving opioids to addicts. So therefore, doctors are drug pushers and doctors are criminals. But opioids are not the cause of addiction. And she pointed, she nailed the main cause, which is childhood sexual abuse or childhood abuse of any kind, because it causes trauma, it causes stress. Stress leads to anxiety, anxiety leads to despair, despair leads to addiction, okay? So that is one of the, the, the thing is though, because they can go after the money and the assets of the doctors, they're totally ignoring the real cause. And addiction is growing exponentially because they are ignoring the real cause of addiction. I do explain the real cause on my website for anyone that is interested. The other problem, 78% of doctors surveyed say that their number one reason for being in the profession is helping people. I know that I chose a medically underserved area for that reason. But what I noticed in my first attack was that the, the attacks on doctors is a form of legal genocide because the expendable populations that we serve in, under, in the underserved areas are those that the government would just as soon see dead as alive. And this includes the elderly, government insured, disabled, poor, and uninsured. So they are basically winning both sides uh, of the decision. Not only do they accumulate doctor's assets by attacking the doctor and using the RICO law and the forfeiture laws against us, but then they also uh, uh, achieve the deaths of these expendable populations because the, the patients basically choose suicide or have to go to street drugs and become overdosed. So the government basically is laughing all the way to the bank. And this is something we have to change. And I do agree that the number one thing to do is to take away the, uh, the uh, actual immunity of the uh, people that are actually committing the crimes, which are the people in the DOJ. And um, I think when we, can, when we can do that and they actually have... Um, we have recourse to actually charge the people that are really breaking the law with the crime uh, that maybe we could see some change. So I, I'd like to, to, to know uh, how we go about that. How do we get rid of actual immunity uh, for these lawbreakers? Um, um, Patrick Henry stated that the um, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's exactly what we see in our society today. Thank you. Just one second. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Cheek. And now we're gonna hear from Dr. Retta M. M. Daniel uh, Alcaraz again. So Dr. Alcaraz, if you can 
um, go ahead and unmute your phone or your microphone. Okay, thank you. I'll apologize if you hear my dogs barking because they just came home. But um, the only way we're going to affect change is Sorry, want to skip me and go to someone else and then come back. Okay, then, because I see that they're again. They're going to be they're, excited for a they're, minute. They're against injustice as well, so they need to calm down <laughs> a bit. Okay, well, what I'll do is I'll go to uh, Mr. Hathaway, and um, so Mr. Hathaway, if you can un un unmute your uh, microphone and go ahead and speak. Okay. So the violations that we've seen, the deprivations of rights are ongoing. We might have won a case. Uh, we know a number of people that have fought. Uh, Ken Rossellini is a great attorney in New Jersey <clears throat> for constitutional rights through federal suits. While uh, he's often able to return children, he's often able to hold them off. He's often able to outlast them for years and years and often doesn't charge afterwards because he knows that people, uh, part of the state's approach is to wear them down and to break them. They can't afford to continue and they lose. Like we were told, you will lose. There is no chance you could win. We said there were we have recordings. It's a complete fraud. We've documented this at every state, at, at every stage. He said, look, there's nothing you can do against this judge. He always listens to them. It makes no difference. If they came to my house, and this was a uh, an attorney, um, uh, Katz, uh, Katzavallis, who is a United States Supreme Court licensed attorney who has brought about precedent to help women. He's, he's a great attorney. They came to his house, took his children. He would never see them again. He would lose. He would spend all his money, spend years fighting, lose his license to practice, and he would still lose his children. There is nothing you can do. He's been in this court for 30 years outside of the Burton County Justice Center, where it's anything else, uh, but, and uh, he, he would lose anyway. There's no chance. Give up. Okay. Uh, the response was, we'll never give up. We'll keep fighting. We went through three attorneys, including him. Uh, he's a very high-priced attorney, uh, ending with Ken Rossellini, who files federal suits, the 1983 suits, uh, federal writs, and he's able to come in. And uh, there's still people out there that are still struggling after seven or eight years. And the biggest uh, hurdle he runs into is qualified immunity. They have no rights. They refuse jury trials. You can read his online. In fact, federal suits are all online and available. And you can see uh, it's the civil rights suits, constitutional rights, uh, the Fourth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, it, it, the list goes on. And they continue to ignore these. And these, there's nothing you can do. The Third Circuit violates them. Ninth Circuit occasion with Sean McMillan. He's one of the attorneys we're collaborating with. Uh, uh, wins. Uh, he's one of the very few cases where they say, no, they cannot lie in court. We will uh, uphold the 14th Amendment due process. We will uphold the Fourth Amendment uh, right to be secure in their own homes. But that's among the very few in the United States. We've occasionally seen one case in the Fourth and the Sixth Circuits. Uh, these, these rights are being violated every day. We have a new foundation. We will not stop until we bring constitutional rights. I think that is foundational. It is fundamental, just like the UN Charter says uh, in the uh, Declaration of Human Rights in the ICCPR. It's the only way to achieve uh, peace, justice uh, in the world. And we see it everywhere. We see it in the, the COVID cases. We see it in uh, civil cases. We see it in criminal cases. And it's just egregious violations where judges can do anything uh, they want. So uh, I'm dedicated. Uh, my group is dedicated. My foundation is dedicated. And my attorneys are dedicated to bringing an end to that. And I think one of the best ways to do that, one of the tools that's available is the ICCPR. Uh, we're failing. We're trying with the, the constitutional rights and they're ignoring them. They, they tell us you have one judge actually said you have no rights. He said, <laughs> um, and in the Burden County Justice Center, there were a number of people, judges and superiors uh, that were um, uh, officials that said, those don't apply to us. We're at the county level. You don't have constitutional rights. Uh, and, and there's nothing anyone can do. The, the, the judges all the way up uh, ignore those. So we need to do everything possible. I think the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, uh, removing qualified immunity, bringing in Title 18, Section 242, which is uh, um, corresponds to Title uh, 42, 1983, which are the federal suits. We have to bring rights into the United States. And I think if we can get Joe Biden, as, as I think you've been uh, pointing out, to get behind the ICCPR efforts, now that the that George Floyd Act has uh, failed, uh, this could be another avenue to try to bring constitutional rights. Uh, we will bring those rights. We will not stop and we will not fail. 
uh, just like our founding fathers, just like uh, Abraham Lincoln, and just like all those people fighting, including um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who brought about human rights mm-hmm. in the United States. We will see those through. So your Thank efforts you. are great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hathaway. Just very inspirational. And now we're going to hear from Dr. J. Joshi. Tell me how to pronounce your last name, Dr. Joshi. It's Joshi. It's Joshi. a you know the Mario character Yoshi, but with a J. Okay. Yeah. My memory is 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 counted to my brain, not not my heart. Go ahead. Not a problem. So first off, I want to uh, thank everybody for telling their stories. Uh, the strength and your credibility lies in the emotions that you convey, uh, and it's not easy to share our stories. Even when I am in the process of sharing my stories, uh, my voice, uh, you know, raises a few tones. I start speaking more quickly. Uh, I have not yet learned to speak with the confidence and credibility that many of you seem to convey when you tell your stories. So I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, I also want to talk about how we can collectively increase our overall credibility because part of what wins in court when the rules are not adhered to is the public persona, the public credibility that your story, that you as individuals carry forth. And one of the things that I found and I advocated for before was understanding the implications of the misconduct. Oftentimes, judicial misconduct goes unnoticed because it seemed to be harmless. It seems to be an inevitable it along what is otherwise the normal course of justice. Same thing with prosecutorial misconduct. If we can help the courts and the public realize the impact of prosecutorial misconduct, of judicial misconduct, and how the outcomes tend to lead to worsening impacts in society, as I alluded to before, worsening impact for patients. As somebody astutely noticed, the misconducts that take place among Children and in federal courts related to children cases have a direct implication in opioid related cases and the judicial misconduct seen there. If we can start to bridge these together and tie together the correlations, we have a very strong case to demonstrate why these misconduct cases should not be protected by immunity, whether it's prosecutorial or judicial immunity, because there are consequences to those actions. And I would like to conclude by referencing a recent study that came out by NBER, NBER, which demonstrated that broad social policy changes, whether that's wealth inequality or the percent of indigent in the population, have a direct impact on individual health outcomes. It was the first study to demonstrate and cross-correlate that with Europe and the United States. We can start to similarly contextualize broad policy and broad misconduct implications on individual effects. That should go a long way to demonstrate that the immunities that we seem to keep perpetuating for the judges and prosecutors have general and significant implications on individual cases, individually impacting society as a whole. And I think as we start to cross-correlate that, we start to strengthen our cases and bring forth stronger credibility.